Hey everybody, uh, I'm Rupa and uh, today with me I have Rohit, my colleague, and we will be talking about um, Linux eVPN on the DPU. And I'm going to talk about DPU in a few slides later. Um, we have talked about eVPN, the Linux eVPN implementation on and off in context of switch dev, in context of many of the uh, enhancements we've done in the Linux kernel over the past years here at NetDev. And uh, in the past, the last year, uh, Rohit, me, and a bunch of other folks uh, who are not here today, but um, we we tried to migrate this to the DPU. And what we want to show you here is how that uh, changes the uh, fabric design or makes it a pure a layer three uh, uh, data center fabric. So let me dive into the slides. So I'll cover in the uh, initial slides, I'm going to cover eVPN, what exists today uh, in terms of Linux eVPN implementation. And Rohit is going to dive into the DPU uh, data path and uh, hardware acceleration and so on. So uh, just a quick recap for people who don't know what eVPN is. eVPN is a distributed network virtualization uh, protocol, right? It uh, is a BGP-based protocol. It is. Um, uh, it has its control plane and data plane, and it's typically in this, uh, uh, as you see, there is it typically runs on the leaf switches. And uh, it is nothing but, yeah, the network virtualization, which is uh, extending layer two over layer three. And this is another view of eVPN implementations. Typically, uh, so on your right, you, you're seeing a leaf spine network. Uh, data center leaf spine network and uh, eVPN, the BGP based protocol runs on the TOR switches or the leaf switches. And it is accelerated in most cases by a, um, a switch ASIC like from NVIDIA or Broadcom and others. And most eVPN and control and data path implementations are proprietary. And when we hear, when we talk about this at NetDev, we are most only talking about the Linux uh, open software eVPN implementation. And so this picture uh, shows about shows the components in a little more detail. There is the FRR BGP stack, and the FRR is a critical piece here. And as you know, we also have a FRR workshop at NetDev every year. And the uh, I'm, I'm sure there is eVPN discussed there as well. So and the rest of the stack, if you see on the leaf switches, is nothing but a Linux uh, bridge, Linux VXLAN. Uh, a stack, right? And the gist of the VPN uh, work uh, protocol is the Linux bridge actually learns uh, local Mac VLANs on its locally connected ports, and BGP listens to it. The FRR BGP implementation listens to this uh, via Netlink and distributes them to its peers and other BGP um, uh, nodes on leaves. And those, in turn, when you receive uh, uh, Mac VLANs from other nodes, it, FRR BGP in turn installs those as a remote Mac VLANs into the Linux bridge. So this pattern is done for Linux uh, FDB, uh, the bridge FDB, the VXLAN FDB. It goes same for routes and uh, neighbor entries and so on. And zooming in a little bit, this is what it uh, looks like. Um, uh, yeah, it's a summary of what I just said. The So critical things are the bridge FTB forwarding table, the VXLAN forwarding table, if you know how it works in the Linux kernel already, and the neighbor table, the neighbor subsystem. And the critical thing is we have uh, to distinguish between the local and the remote entries for BGP to understand, we uh, tag each entry with flags. And one of them is NTF EXT learn. And there are many other flags over the years uh, we have added into the Linux kernel. So this is a uh, snapshot of how the data path flows uh, in the Linux eVPN implementation. So this is nothing but a typical layered uh, NetDev stack. The, you have the Linux bridge, then you have the VLAN, you have WERPs, and L3 VNIs are nothing but, again, uh, VXLAN. Uh, endpoints. So what we're showing here in this picture is we have two tenants. 
Um, again, this is uh, since it's network virtualization and it's multi-tenant, uh, we map VLANs to VNIs, and VLAN actually uh, maps to a tenant. And this picture shows the layer two, layer two flows between the Linux uh, kernel bridge and VXLAN subsystems and uh, layer three. So coming back to what are the hardware acceleration implementations today that exist for EVPN, right? So the data path implementation, the kernel data path implementation is closer to what a switch ASIC EVPN data path implement or switch ASIC EVPN data path today. It's similar to that. And the natural choices of hardware acceleration are if you need an open implementation, it's a switch dev driver to some extent. And or most of these switch ASICs, they come with SDKs in user space, which are closed. And so whatever driver you write in user space also needs to be closed. And we are talking about a closed Netlink driver here, but uh, we are going to talk about the Netlink implementation more than you know, getting into the details of uh, how the SDKs are implemented, if you will. So this is how it generally looks like a Netlink driver in user space, FRR talking to the kernel and Netlink drivers snooping and hardware accelerating uh, with, you know, whether the Netlink driver may be talking to an SDK, may be talking to DPDK or any means to get to the hardware for systems that don't have an in-kernel driver. Now let's dive into the DPU, right? DPU, as you um, might have heard, uh, it is a new piece, it's a data processing unit. It's a new piece in the whole data center disaggregation space. So DPUs can offload your uh, hardware accelerate your broad range of your uh, network services or storage or security services. So the whole idea is your server processors are free from infrastructure or uh, the infrastructure services basically having to run infrastructure services. So this is a picture of the DPU on the right. It has ARM cores, it has accelerators, and the it is it has a NIC, right? NIC and ARM cores. So the idea is you run all your control planes, network and storage control planes, move them from the host to the DPU. And uh, and the other major advantage or of a DPU is isolating these infrastructure services from a security standpoint. Uh, and th this is very relevant for, uh, for example, a um, uh, bare metal, bare, uh, BMAS solution where you want to isolate your infrastructure services from the host system where your host system may be you know, um, running other customer uh, workloads or um, virtualization stacks. And uh, to take that thing, uh, further to ta talking about uh, DPU as a network infrastructure services platform, you have moved all your infrastructure services to the DPU. You also won't have the choice of um, orchestrating or operating it as two different systems, uh, right? So you have, for example, if you're using a Kubernetes uh, control plane to orchestrate your hosts, you can have another Kubernetes infrastructure services control plane to just uh, manage and operate your um, infrastructure services and infrastructure services are nothing but again security services or storage services and so on and um, yeah so again this is typically this uh, is very directly applicable to a bare metal uh, as a service where you have the security isolation of a dpu uh, for your infrastructure services now, this is a repeat of the previous picture, which I started with. You are now, if you, in this talk, we're talking about moving that eVPN uh, implementation, both control and uh, the data path to the DPU. So what does this change, right? It 
changes it, it moves your layer to layer three boundary to the DPU, making your leaf layer or the switches completely layer three. So you have kind of simplified your network. You don't necessarily need redundancy protocols like uh, M lag to between switches. It can literally be L3 ECMP from about the DPU or from about the host. DPU is an extension of the host. So that's what we are we tried to do, and we're we're talking about in this uh, talk here. So what does this uh, mean? This is another view of what it means to be uh, means to moving the EVPN implementation onto the DPU. So your DPUs become your VXLAN endpoints, and your FRR is running on the DPU. Uh, there, it's a completely layer three ECMP fabric. Um, plug and play connectivity between DPU and using something called uh, BGP unnumbered, as you already know. So you don't have to manage uh, BG, the FRR BGP implementation or unnumbered implementation actually simplifies uh, this whole network because you're now increasing uh, the scale of your uh, BTAP endpoints. And you really need something like BGP unnumbered to uh, operate it easily. So just a quick note on deployment patterns for trying to integrate your uh, DPU. Uh, so this is another picture where it shows a host and your DPU. And you have PFs uh, between connecting the host to the DPU, right? And P or PF representers. So what we're saying is you can treat the DPU in this picture as a trunk port or a switch. You literally treat it as a switch. You have a trunk port from the uh, DPU to the host. And we have the VLAN VNI map, exactly like how we treat had it on the switch. And same tenant on the same host won't go through the DPU, but same tenant on separate hosts, they go to the DPU. So this is a typical uh, BMAS uh, uh, structure because you um, don't, the DPU orchestrator does not really care about what is running on the host. The host is free to run any of its uh, network, like you, you could run OBS on the host, for example. And the other implementation, this one is for SRIOV, where your host and DPU do, the DPU network really extends into the host, uh, providing virtual representers to the host. And um, the VF, VLAN mapping changes in this, uh, in this uh, type of deployment. And this is works well when you have a, each, as you know, each VF, uh, provision for a container or a VM. And the DPU is involved in most flows uh, in this case. And this is a, again another uh, view of the network flow for tenants for layer two and layer three communication between uh, two hosts connected via a DPU. And um, so this that is in uh, trunk mode. And now let me just uh, hand over to uh, my colleague Rohit here, who's going to talk about the hardware acceleration pieces. Rohit, I'm going to help move the slides. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Rupa. Uh, yeah. In this part of the presentation, uh, I will cover the hardware acceleration. Yeah. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, this uh, slide uh, uh, gives the, the major components involved in the hardware acceleration. Um, as uh, Rupa already mentioned, the FRR builds up all the EVPN state and pushes to the kernel. And we have a Netlink driver uh, in the user space, which uh, listens to the um, network, sta uh, uh, network states via the Netlink channel and, and consumes these states and translate them into the uh, DPU flow tables. Uh, once the uh, flow tables are programmed in the DPU, uh, the hard, uh, all the packet steering happens as per the flow table. Yeah, you can go. Next slide. Yeah, uh, this kind of uh, this uh, slide will help uh, to map where each of those components run. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, all the networking functionalities are offloaded to the DPU. 
and uh, so in the dpu we have two components one major uh, is the arm core where most of the control plane application runs for example the kernel um, uh, uh, kernel and frr uh, then uh, uh, if up down to inter which is access like uh, interface manager and even the netlink netlink accelerator runs on the arm core uh, and the uh, and the programmed uh, tc flows are uh, deep, the the end dpu flow tables are in the e switch uh, and uh, yeah, and also in the in the dpu we use the netdev representer to map each one of the host side phys host side physical and uh, virtual function um, in the in the diagram here uh, shows the mapping between the pca functions exposed on the host side and the representer uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we have shown only the single port model here. And uh, the red arrow demonstrates a packet, how the packet flow happens through the representers, uh, while the green arrow demonstrates the packet flow when the steering rules are offloaded to the embedded switch. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, so in this slide, uh, kind of uh, uh, shows how the, the Netlink offload driver interacts with the other, echo, uh, other components in the ecosystem. Uh, so, for example, to start with, in the user space, uh, we have the FRR, uh, which builds up all the uh, EVPN uh, network state and pushes the kernel. And we have the IF up down to uh, uh, running in the user space again, uh, which acts like an interface manager and it pushes all the interface states. Um, in the kernel, we have all the states built up, like uh, the interface, um, the routes, uh, like FIB. Uh, FDB contains uh, the, all the L2 uh, entries and the VXLAN interfaces and the next stop. And for each of these uh, network states or network uh, types, uh, we have a separate uh, network uh, Netlink channel uh, uh, open from the Netlink offload driver and consumes this state. And then uh, after uh, after consuming this state, the Netlink offload driver translates them into TC flower rules and programs them into the kernel via again through the netlink channel and once these uh, uh, rules are programmed in the kernel the mlx file driver uh, translates them into the appropriate uh, flow tables in the connectx and uh, then uh, afterwards all the packet steering happens through the how the flow tables programmed in the connectx yeah. next. next slide yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let's uh, zoom in uh, uh, a little bit more detail into the Netlink offload driver. Um, as I mentioned, uh, so we uh, we have separate uh, Netlink cache for each of the Netlink uh, uh, type, uh, Netlink uh, entity type. Uh, for example, we have a, a Netlink cache, separate Netlink cache for interface for the FIB, uh, for the FDB, and the VXLAN, uh, uh, and the next stops. Uh, and the the netlink offload driver uses a state and then translate them into uh, resolved l2 entries uh, which forms the fdp entries and uh, and the, and also it also translate uh, and also uh, uh, translate them into resolved l3 entries which forms our uh, for the forwarding entity for the l3 forwarding uh, so then uh, so once this uh, resolved l2 and l3 entries are formed uh, these again are translated into corresponding uh, uh, L2 TC flow, flower rules and actions. Uh, and once this uh, TC uh, flower rules and actions are uh, formed, uh, the Netlink offload driver uses the Netlink uh, interface again uh, to program into the kernel. Uh, once these TC flower rules are uh, available in the kernel, the MLX file driver uh, programs into the appropriate uh, uh, tables, match, matches, uh, match. Uh, matches and the actions in the in the connectx uh, so that the packet uh, steering can happen appropriately yeah yeah this uh, slide gives you the uh, a quick overview of how these uh, uh, various tables are built in the netlink uh, offload driver uh, to uh, just to at the high level you can uh, you can see that uh, the left part of the diagram like basically the tables with the blue uh, 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 blue in color those those are all the tables used in the ncap direction and uh, the tables with the uh, red uh, red in color which are used in the decap uh, uh, in the uh, in the decap direction um, so basically typically the, the in the ncap direction um, so uh, 
the packet reaches the the corresponding either the uh, virtual representer or the physical representer and uh, once it re reaches the corresponding representer it goes through a vlan filter table after the vlan filter uh, table uh, it goes through the uh, fdb uh, lookup bridge table lookup um, so if it is a local max then up it is directed to the appropriate port if it is a vxlan dmac uh, then we uh, uh, then we do a encapsulation and uh, send it out to the corresponding l2 vni um, so once it comes to the l2 vni uh, we have uh, 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 we can uh, since there are uh, multiple uh, uplinks are available um, so we can uh, use uh, we use the underlay ecmp again uh, to select uh, the uh, uh, to select one of the uplink ports and once according to the uplink port selected uh, we uh, do a, a, a L2 underlay L2 encapsul uh, sorry underlay L2 rewrite and send it over to the uh, send it over the remote uh, host for the uplinks. Um, in the decap direction, once the packet comes through the uplink ports, it is uh, forwarded to the corresponding uh, uh, VNIs. Um, so it could be an L2 VNI or an L3 VNI. Uh, so in case of uh, L2 uh, VNI, we decapsulate the packet and uh, based on the um, the overlay. Uh, uh, overlay D, uh, overlay Mac, uh, we forward the packet to the uh, corresponding uh, uh, representer. Uh, whereas in case of uh, L3 VNI, uh, so we do the decapsulation uh, and also we, after the decapsulation, uh, we also do the L2 rewrite uh, and then um, then forward the packet based on the, uh, 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 the inner IP, which is the overlay IP uh, to the corresponding uh, uh, port. Can go to the next one yeah so those are the tables uh, in the previous slide what i expect was those are the tables we form in the net in the netlink offload driver but actually what is uh, uh, uh translated into the hardware is, uh, is this is the one ba basically we, we want to optimize uh, uh, so that we do a minimal table lookups uh, so as and when the packet enters so basically it uh, goes into the port table and it can uh, take one of uh, one of these four uh, actions so in case of uh, 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 L2 case, so in the L2 NCAP case, so it goes to the FDB table and uh, based on the DMAC and the port on which it is coming, so uh, we do the L, uh, encapsulation and uh, set the VNI and redirect to the L2 VNI interface. Um, and in case of L3, uh, we do a lookup on the uh, uh, destination IP and uh, uh, then do the overlay uh, rewrite, L2 rewrite and then do the tunnel encapsulation and re redirect to the corresponding L3 VNI. Uh, so once it goes to the VNI uh, table where we look up on the uh, VNI, uh, uh, VNI, VNI information, um, so uh, we select the underlay uh, uh, uplink uh, on which the packet has to be sent. Uh, so this is the ECMP part. And so once we select the uh, corresponding uplink port, uh, we do the Underlay, underlay L2 rewrite and then uh, redirect uh, send a, uh, redirect the packet on the corresponding uplink port. Uh, so this is the NCAP direction. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, DCAP, uh, so basically in the case of L2 DCAP, uh, we just look at on the the destination, uh, the outer destination port and IP. Uh, and also we match on the L2 VNI and the inner MAC in a single match and uh, do the L2 decapsulation and uh, uh, se uh, send it to the appropriate uh, uh, port. Um, so in the case of L3, uh, which uh, we also uh, similar to the uh, 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 tunnel match, we do this here as well. Uh, but uh, here we also match on the uh, inner IP. Uh, and uh, once we match on this, uh, if it is a hit, so we basically the, the action here includes uh, uh, tunnel decapsulation. And also in the case of uh, uh, L3 decap, we also do a uh, 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 L2 over rewrite uh, before forwarding to the corresponding access port. Yeah. Uh, we can go to the next table. Yeah, so uh, this type, uh, this table kind of uh, summarize what I explained in my uh, previous slides. Uh, this uh, just a quick uh, uh, summary of what I explained in my previous slide. Uh, I, I think uh, we can go. We can move to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So just to give an uh, how uh, uh, an overview of how the actually the config looks and how the uh, the flows are formed uh, from the uh, FDB entries and the corresponding FIB entries. Uh, so this is a, a simple uh, L, 
VXLAN configuration, what we are having here, EVPIN configuration. Uh, so here uh, we have a uh, bridge configured with the access ports. Basically, the, all the uh, either the we can configure the access ports as uh, uh, virtual uh, VF uh, representers or a, a PF representers here. Um, then uh, uh, then we have the corresponding SVA configured, uh, and then we have uh, also an L2 VNA and L3 VNA configured as well. Um, uh, uh, just uh, taken a simple single uh, L2 VNA, L3 VNA, just for simplicity here. Yeah. I do want to point out that this is in the IF of down to config format, uh, but essentially it, the IF of down to translates this to the bridge, IP route to bridge, VXLAN, and uh, yeah, a bunch of IP link commands. Yeah, so once with this kind of configuration, so this is what how the FDB entries looks. So, for example, here what I'm showing is a, the remote DMAC uh, where we going over the uh, tunnel. Uh, so basically, we are, need to use the destination IP for the tunnel as 10.10.10.1. Uh, uh, so for this one, we will look at how the TC rules look like. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, Rohit, since we have more time, I'm just going to explain a little more <laughs> because I yeah. think we have some time. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, to Rohit's point, right, this is the FDB entries. And you can see uh, that the external learn is a entry that the first entry is actually installed by FRR to point. Uh, this is an entry that it got from the other peer. And uh, the next entry is nothing but it's a, this is the way VXLAN FDB in the kernel works. Basically, you have the bridge FDB entry and the corresponding V VXLAN FDB entry, which has the remote IP. And then these two are the local MAC entries that uh, the bridge, Linux bridge itself learned. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is the TC uh, rules, how it looked like. So basically here, what it shows is that we are matching on the, uh, the PF0, VF0 uh, uh, interface and the MAC uh, and the MAC here the overlay Mac and uh, and also the ETH type. So if we match on this, so basically uh, there is a flag called in hardware that indicates that it's been hardware offloaded. Basically, this entry is translate is programmed in the hardware uh, in the that is in the connect text. And uh, then uh, what are the, act the actions here indicate is that we are uh, doing the encapsulation where uh, destination IP is 10.10.1 uh, as we saw in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the previous slide, the the remote the the IP we, the tunnel IP we need to use for this, and uh, then the source IP is the local uh, IP uh, for the tunnel what we use 10.10.3 here, and uh, then the destination port uh, basically this is about all about the uh, VXLAN encapsulation, and uh, once it the the, the encapsulation is done, uh, we direct onto the VNI interface which is VNI 10. That's what it shows the next action. Uh, so once it goes over the VNI 10, uh, so basically the uh, we have a corresponding entry to uh, do an uh, underlay rewrite and send it on to the uh, uplink. Uh, so this is the end cap direction. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and uh, the corresponding uh, uh, decap uh, rule for this, right? Like for example, packet uh, uh, from the remote end coming to the, the max, uh, uh, to one of the local max. So this is how it looks. So basically, we are matching on the uh, uh, tunnel IP, uh, which is 10.10.3, uh, which is our uh, our local IP, and uh, this is the the, the destination, the VXLAN port, um, and uh, then we are matching also on the overlay MAC. So if all these are matched, so basically we are just uh, uh, doing the tunnel unset here, uh, and also you can see that here also the in hardware is flag is set. Uh, so if it is uh, that is that indicates that it has been translated in, in the or offloaded into the connectex um, then we do a tunnel decapsulation and after tunnel decapsulation we just uh, forward it to the one of our uh, the local interface which is pf0 vf0 here uh, now let's look at some of these uh, uh, evpn routes as well um, so this is how the EVPN route uh, looks like. So basically, uh, it indicates uh, uh, basically the those 10.1.10.101 uh, and 102 
or uh, needs to be sent over the tunnel which is the remote end is this 10.10.1 uh, uh, for the first entry and the, the sec for the second entry is the the remote uh, uh, vtap ip is 10.10.2 uh, .10 uh, so this is how it looks and also we have the corresponding NAI entries as well i'm just showing for the completeness here yeah uh, so here uh, uh, so here it uh, here it shows how the uh, the TC rules uh, are formed for this kind of uh, FDB, uh, uh, sorry, for the FIB entries. Uh, so here, uh, again, it is ingressing on the PF VF0, and we are matching on the uh, overlay IP, which is 10.1.10.101. .1 and once this is matched, so basically we are, uh, are doing a, a tunnel encapsulation, and uh, also before that, we are also doing L2 rewrite here. Uh, that is the P edit action what we have. So basically, we form with the P edit action. We do the L2 rewrite, uh, and then we do the tunnel set, and then send it on to the uh, corresponding VNI L3 VNI, which is the uh, VNI interface here. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, this is uh, uh, how the decap looks like here. Uh, we uh, yeah, along with the uh, the tunnel headers, uh, we also match on the overlay uh, inner IP. Uh, once it, that is uh, uh, matched, uh, so basically we do a, a, a P edit action, uh, so to L2 rewrite, and then we also do a tunnel unset. And once we do the decapsulation, we uh, redirect to the corresponding uh, access side port. Uh, 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 that's it, I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think Rupa can take. Yeah. Yeah. So to end the talk, um, we would like to thank a bunch of people who have worked on the project. Uh, we were actually working on this to uh, for the BMAS GPU cloud, NVIDIA GPU cloud systems. And yeah, so acknowledgments there. And to summarize, I think uh, what we have tried to show here is we had been working on the Linux eVPN data path in the kernel for a number of years, last few years. And I, I think as long as you're in uh, a, on a kernel greater than 4.19, you can get most of the features that are shown here and the entire uh, eVPN implementation. And it was very easy for us to actually migrate that solution to a DPU, which was already running an Ubuntu with a uh, yeah 4.19 and higher kernel. So the only thing that we had to do was uh, just the netlink translation right and the netlink translation itself the uh, the quickest thing was to see what works for the existing hardware acceleration implementations the mlx by driver already uh, supports tc flower so that was the best uh, path that we could take and like rohit uh, explained how he had to map all the kernel data path constructs to Netlink, Netlink cache, and then uh, TC Flower. And there are other implementations possible, like uh, you can have the Netlink to DPDK translator, which Rohit has also uh, worked on. And um, and yeah, uh, could be translated using the switch dev interface in the kernel as well. That's all, all we had. Thanks a lot. And uh, ready to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was probably the most timely video we've ever ever recorded. Everybody goes about their time limit, except for this one. Thanks. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> All right. The was good and the content was good. That's Shrijit speaking there. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. He finally showed up. So, questions? So how does this uh, um, Netlink, uh, Netlink daemon, how, how does this uh, differ from something like Open vSwitch and what would uh, lead people to choose one or the other? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, am I hearing an echo? 
Yeah, so the uh, kernel OVS, for example, the OVS data path, right? It's not, uh, it's a separate data path than the kernel routing and bridging and Linux, uh, VXLAN, the rest of it. The advantage here is you can run your existing, uh, the EVPN Linux implementation in software in the kernel uh, with the Linux routing and uh, bridge driver and so on. and seamlessly uh, offload it to hardware using this Netlink translator, right? Um, but this could be done by an in-kernel driver as well, like a switch dev driver that uh, programs to hardware. The key difference is what data path you use in the kernel. It's not the OBS data path, but it's the regular Linux routing and bridging. Does that help? Yeah, I think that answers it. Yeah, I think the other thing is even OVS would use the same mechanism. It will go through Flower to offload. Yeah, that's why I was asking because it's that's the I see. big similarity there. Uh, if I may comment, um, we have programmed this specific board with Flower with a totally different data path. So we our, our needs had nothing to do. With, we didn't need routing, for example. It was just an alcohol and some sort of load balancing. So we could construct our own scheme, basically. Yeah, the other other angle here is the FRR, right? FRR, the routing protocol, it uses the Linux, uh, the Linux implementation, at least the Linux data path. Uh, it uses the non-OVS path today, right? And yeah, translating that to hardware, that's the whole idea. Um, but your OVS to, yeah, well, uh, OBS is its own has its own control plane and it has its own data plane and so on. So it's an alternate uh, stack to do virtualization, you can say. Uh, but this talk was mostly focused on the control plane that FRR uses for the BGP-based virtualization stack. There's nothing remote. No, 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 we remote. Uh, no questions from remote? I don't think we've ever hit our time like, line, like this talk. This like is the first this? Time. Because, yeah, that's what happens when you're scheduling, when you're also involved in scheduling. <laughs> yeah, I should, yeah. We, should, we should point out that every talk here has been scheduled by Rupa at this point, except uh, some by Jamal, <laughs> but those are the ones that are trouble. <laughs> <laughs> The ones that video, the video failed? Okay. Or oh, the ones that were DOS attacked? Yes, both. <laughs> uh, yeah. But TSN, TSN did finish on time. Um, okay, thanks, uh, Rupa, Rohit. And let's give them a hand of applause. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.